So my name is Chris. I work at the Chester Media Laboratories, which are near Imperial College in uh, Chelsea. I passed it, and the Institute of Cancer Research is over 100 years old. It's been there uh, since the early 1900s. And really, we do a lot of basic research as well as, as one of the biggest drug developers in the world, actually. Uh, I was told maybe to talk a little bit about my career and how I got to be a cancer researcher, which is slightly unusual. When I was your age, I was uh, very interested in ski racing and not really interested in science whatsoever. And when I went to uh, university, I went to the University of British Columbia, and I started off as an English history and philosophy triple major, and I was particularly interested in postmodern Czechoslovakian literature. This was my favorite subject. So, I was very passionate about this, this, this particular author, and I thought my whole life and my whole career was going to be in postmodern Czechoslovakian literature. Uh, maybe for good, maybe for bad. Uh, I had to take one science course, and I took one uh, microbiology course, which happened to be taught by one of the pioneers of antibiotic resistance in micro and microbes. He discovered, for example, that there's antibiotics in the sewage, and that's how they pass on antibiotic resistance. Julian Davies, and he really switched my entire head around. I dropped on my arts degree, I dropped English, I dropped uh, postmodern Czechoslovakian literature and became a biochem major. And really, he, this one single course changed my entire career and really made me a scientist. From there, I went to study cancer biology at the University of Toronto, where I have a PhD in medical biophysics, and I really started yeah, my interest in cells, and these are cells up here, and really, I. Once I started uh, working on a microscope in Toronto, I haven't really left. I went then, after my PhD, I was a fellow at Harvard Medical School and uh, MIT at the same time. One in genetics at Harvard Medical School, and really at MIT, I did training in computer science and AI at the same time. So that's merging this kind of education together is really how, how I now use AI in, in uh, cancer biology. And I'm, as I said, I've, after I left my postdoc, I've been at the Institute of Cancer Research where I hold my own lab. So how does someone, how do they, you know, why do we care about cancer research so much and what, why should we care about cancer research so much? Well, one in two of us is probably going to get cancer. And in fact, fun cancer fact, if we all live long enough, we'll all get cancer. So if men live long enough, all of us will get prostate cancer. If women live long enough, they will all get breast cancer. So it's really, go, it, if it hasn't affected you or your family already, it certainly will. Now, the good news is, if you call it good news, is that it's, we've done very well, especially over the last few decades, in coming up with really new treatments and really new ways to make cancer patients uh, extend their well-being, make their lives a lot better. So 50% of people that get cancer will survive for 10 years or longer. Many will become cured, and that's because of really advances in all sorts of drugs, therapies that we have now available to us. It's, uh, for example, now most women with breast cancer will not die of the disease. So, and that's changed in the last 50 years. Of course, the unfortunate fact is that for there's another half of patients where treatment fails. And some cancers, in particular lung cancer, pancreatic cancer, and brain cancer, uh, we are doing very, very badly right now. In fact, there's really no cure for pancreatic cancer, especially. It's particular, it's almost a death sentence when people get it. So we're still failing for 50% of patients out there, and we need to come up with better ways, better treatments, better diagnosis. And really, it comes down to finding the right treatments for the right patients. Everyone's cancer is going to be different, so how do we find the right therapy for each patient? And this is not just important to cure the cancer, but it's also an important economic problem, especially these days. So we have great new therapies, great new treatments. For example, this is one called anti-PD-1, anti-CTLA-4. It's called immunotherapy. It's one of the hottest, if you call it that, therapies out here right now. But it costs this much per year per patient. That's almost as much as a house costs. So we don't want to give a treatment like this to a patient that's not going to benefit. And we have to make sure that if, uh, the patient is going to, that if we're going to do this, if we're going to, the health system or the patient is going to outlay this much money, that that treatment is going to work. And really, we're not doing so well right now. A lot of people are getting this, and it might not even work. So we have to fix this problem. Now, I'm particularly interested in cancer from the aspect of cell shape. And I'll tell you a little bit more about why I care so much about cell shape in a second. But 
really this is how I got into biology to begin with, and that's just, I'm absolutely fascinated by how cells get different shapes. These are melanoma cells. This is a melanoma cell here. It looks like almost like a flower petal or a big leaf, but it's really kind of beautiful and amazing how it gets these different structures. And as a biologist, I'm completely fascinated by how all the different cells in your body get different shapes. Why does a muscle cell have a different shape than a neuron? Why does your heart cell have a different shape than a bone cell? I mean, it's a really fascinating biological problem. But from cancer, it's a particularly important problem because we know, we've known this really for almost 100 years, 100 years now, that cancer cells have a different shape than normal cells. And even if you've never seen cells before, these are normal, this is what normal cells look like, those are what cancer cells look like, you can probably already tell that cancer has a different shape than normal cells. And this really means a lot, and we think uh, that by studying this problem, we can really have an impact on cancer biology. And this is particularly important because there's two kinds of cancers. There's a kind of cancer where it sticks in the primary tumor, so you might get a lump or somewhere, and if it stays there and it doesn't change its shape, it's sensitive. It's a curable disease. It's sensitive to treatments, and it's a curable disease. So this is what's called the primary tumor. If it just sits there, you, you can be cured. However, if the cells spread to other parts in the body, where a process called metastasis, where they have to change their shape, and so they leave the primary tumor, spread throughout the body into different tissues, they have to change their shape. And it's when they change their shape into this form of the disease that 90% of patients die. So it becomes a, goes from a curable disease to an incurable one once the cell changes its shape. And we think that if we can target these cell shape changes, we may be able to help the vast majority of patient deaths out there. Now, what we do in the lab is use AI-based technologies to study cancer cell shape, and I'll explain why we need to do that uh, in a second. So for one, to study cancer cell shape, we do a lot of imaging and a lot of microscopy work. And we've trained and are continuing to train different AI-based methods to really see cells and quantify cell shape. Just like AI-based methods to recognize faces on your phone or uh, different methods that self-driving cars are using AI now, we're trying to use these same methods to find cells in pictures from microscopes. We use AI-based methods in screens, so if we're trying to find new drugs or new genes that are causing cancer, we use AI-based methods. And we finally uh, incorporate a lot of this data that we generate using AI into big data models. So we really think that the most powerful thing we can do to study cancer is look at cells and look at them in the lab. So this is a picture again of some cancer cells and we think there's a lot of information in the shape of these cells. The question is, how do we extract it? How do we get a computer to see these cells? And then how do we get a computer to see that each one of these is different? How do we get one to see that one is cancer, one is not, that one is a different type of cancer, etc.? And it starts really at the microscope. Uh, micro this is an old-fashioned microscope that's sitting on my desk. But really, this is a mic more of the microscopes we use now. So some of the microscopes that we have now there's only a few of these in the entire world. It's called a lattice light sheet microscope. It can take very high resolution images of cells in 3D. I hope maybe this will work. Let's see. It does. So this is a melanoma cell, a single melanoma cell in a three-dimensional gel. This is probably one of the first images taken like this ever. And you can see, hopefully you can see that these cells are very round and they're trying to reach out, feel around their environment. They're sending out these little projections essentially trying to see what's going on around it, trying to uh, sense if there's any food or any nutrients out there, and if there's oxygen. And it's essentially trying to, uh, you know, it's almost like menacing the way it's doing this, trying to essentially search its environment to find a better place to live. This is another melanoma cell taken with a different kind of microscope, an EM microscope. In the blue is the melanoma cell, and this is the tissue around it. And you can see, I think, in this image how, like, the cell is essentially embedded in this tissue, trying to invade it, really trying to re remodel the tissue around it. So we think this, these cell-shaped changes that are making are really important for cancer progression. And this is finally a patient from a cell image from a tumor cell. So this is what a, it, a, a hundreds, if not thousands, of different cells look like in a patient tumor. So this is why we need AI, because a lot of these pictures are extraordinarily complicated, and the human eye may be able to see them but trying to extract information out of these complex images is essentially beyond a human. And if we have millions and millions of images, we can't essentially be looking at them one at a time. 
So we use, we've developed algorithms. When I was at Harvard, we developed one algorithm, for example, to scan through millions and millions of different cell images very quickly and find different cell shapes we are interested in. And as I said, it works very similar to the way you might work in the, uh, for example, CCTV footage is scanned on the tube, trying to look for uh, suspicious people. We are essentially looking for suspicious cells in a lot, millions and millions of different images. And so using these algorithms we've developed, the computer can find individual cells, these are cells here, we can find the individual boundaries, and we can make measurements, hundreds of different measurements from individual cells. We can do this from millions of different cells. And we can do this in the context of high throughput screens. So we, we might say that this is a normal cell. We can essentially take out every gene in that cell one at a time. So we have 25,000 genes in a cell. We can take out one at a time and see what happens to the cell shape. And again, there's 25,000 genes in one, in one cell. We don't want to look at 25,000 different images. So we've got computers that can look through all these images and essentially quantify what happens when you knock out each individual gene 25,000 times over. From that, we can define new drug targets. All these go into big data models. So if we have different models where essentially we can link shapes to genes, to patient data, to drugs. And building these models is very important to us because it's getting to our goal of trying to tailor new therapies to each person's cancer. So the idea is, and this is really the challenge that we're trying to solve, is if you have a patient and if a patient has a tumor, can you look at that, those cancer cells and can you find which drug that particular cell might be sensitive to and which one might be resistant. And then for each patient and each person's cancer, can you give them the exact right therapy that they need and they, that would just be tailored exquisitely to them. But in order to do this, we need to get the computers to recognize the cancers and to make predictions as to which drugs would be best for that patient. Finally, this sort of crazier concept we're working on these days is if cell shape is so important for cancer and we can make diagnostic uh, predictions based on the shape of a single cell, can we do it from the entire shape of a person's body? So for example, can I look at you and say whether you're going to get a particular disease? Can I look at your face and see whether you're going to get cancer? And this sounds perhaps a bit crazy, but it's not. So this is one of my old bosses, uh, George Church, and what he is doing is for, for patients enrolled in his study he sequences their entire genome, and he takes a picture of their face. And then that little strip on his forehead there, so he can align the pictures of all the patient's faces, and so that he can get computers to recognize the face exactly and align all the images. And then from the facial details, can he match that to the disease profile? This hasn't worked for cancer yet, but it has worked for other diseases. So just by looking at, another pers at a person's face from a photograph, a computer can tell whether you're going to get particular types of diseases. So there's lots of information in the shape of cells, there's lots of information in the shape of tissues, and we believe there's lots of information in the shape of your face and the shape of your body that's going to tell us about your own disease and how we can best treat it. So that's it. That's all I have to say. Just want to, uh, all my work is supported by uh, Stand Up to Cancer and CRUK.